uh, why don't we get started? Uh, so what I'll do is finish up where we left off last time and then take a brief pause uh, to look a little bit at MATLAB and then continue on uh, with the next module about uh, learning feasibility. So where we left off, um, oh yeah, so there's the uh, project is due on the 21st, uh, a second before midnight. Uh, and uh, so that's coming up. You both know about that. Uh, so when we last left off, we talked about uh, the perceptron learning algorithm. And this is an approach uh, for updating uh, the weight vector corresponding uh, to your linear model. And so we mentioned in the anatomy of a learner uh, that it's the learning algorithm's job to search uh, through the set of hypotheses for a different hypothesis or function uh, and then to check that against all the training data to measure its coincidence uh, with the ground truth target function, which is unknown, hidden from you. Uh, and so as this search proceeds, this update effectively corrects for errors. And by this PLA algorithm, you select an incorrectly classified point. So something whose ground truth class label assigned by the target function was minus one, and the classifier of the hypothesis or the current working hypothesis said plus one, or vice versa. And so what ends up happening graphically, if you had a 2D model, meaning two features, uh, two uh, aspects of a description of a customer uh, in this credit approval problem that we'd been carrying from last time, uh, suppose someone was a good credit risk uh, and they had a plus one ground truth label, but they were classified by some version of your uh, classifier, your hypothesis, your current working hypothesis as being negative. So then when you did this PLA update, essentially you're searching for a new hypothesis and this update, as we saw before uh, with uh, that example with inner products, that it effectively chooses a different hypothesis that corrects for that error. Now, of course, there's an assumption made uh, on the data when you're using the PLA algorithm. And that assumption is that the data is so-called linearly separable. What that means is that you can use a linear model, whether that's a line on the plane or a hyperplane in more than two dimensions, in order to separate uh, the positive instances, ground truth from your historical data, the plus one uh, data items, uh, from the minus one data items. Now, of course, you might ask what happens if your data is not linearly separable? Well, we'll get to that, okay. And so this decision boundary, as it's called, moves as you select a new hypothesis. Because if you're selecting a new weight vector W, which is essentially what this update is doing, it's changing W from the previous round to the next round as you uh, compute this update. And in changing W, you're selecting a different line, okay? And you're selecting a different line such that you correct for this misclassified point. Okay. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? Okay. And so continuing on, some of the questions you might ask, well, is that really it? Yeah. It's a pretty simple algorithm, kind of in a scary way. And this is a very simple model, and the update is very simple. But what you'll see over the course of the semester from this very simple model, you can do a lot of powerful things by just tinkering with different aspects of the architecture of a learner. So some of the questions you might also ask, well, we talked about this PLA update. And as you apply this W gets W uh, plus XI, YI, you might ask yourself, well, how many times do you apply this update? It's a very good question. It depends on your problem. So in truth, well, as many rounds as you quote unquote need to, right? So that doesn't really help very much. But as you look at the errors over your um, historical data between the current working hypothesis and the ground truth target function, you'll effectively in an algorithm count the number of errors that are made from one version of the hypothesis to the next. Now, one approach about this halting criteria, i.e. how many times you apply this update, how many rounds you do that, uh, one approach says, okay, I look at the error and I track its gradient over time by how much does it change. And if it doesn't change significantly, like within 5% of its previous value, then you say it's done once the change is less than 5%. So that's one approach. Another approach uh, says, okay, well, on my platform, I can only afford a certain amount of computation. 
And so maybe after a thousand rounds, regardless of how well or how poorly it's doing, I'm going to stop because that's all the computation I can afford. And that's another example. So another question that you can ask is, will this work for any problem? Well, I'll say yes in quotes, right? Yes, because if your problem is not linearly separable, well, PLA will try its best, but there are some problems for which a straight line will not separate your data. In some problems, maybe you need a parabola, or maybe you need something more complex than just a linear model, whether it's in two dimensions, three dimensions, or some higher order or number of dimensions, right? So that's another problem that we'll deal with. And what we'll see that we can change the so-called geometry of the feature space. This figure here, where we represent each piece of data as a point in some high dimensional representation, and then we said, each value or attribute, in the case of the credit approval problem, the projection of each point along one axis represents one feature. So maybe this coordinate would be uh, 33,000 comma 10, where the 33,000 would represent the annual salary and the 10 would represent the number of years in residence for that particular customer. And so if you look at the points in feature space, there's a geometry among them, the relative relationships in space, be that in two dimensions, three dimensions, or some higher order number of dimensions. So there are approaches that we'll learn where you can actually transform this uh, space or transform, compute some function over each of the features, collectively representing each data point. And in doing so, if you do it correctly, you can transform the geometry of the space to make it a more amenable to certain types of models. And so one transformation is called a linearizing transformation. Does it work for all geometries? Absolutely not. But if you're able to very efficiently change the geometry through a transformation, change the geometry of the points in the space for a non-linearly separable problem, now once it's linearly separable, something as simple as PLA with a linear model on the result of that uh, will give you a very computationally cheap way guaranteeing you a good uh, classification, good generalization. Okay. Does that make sense? Any questions about this? So while PLA is a very simple model, by doing other things to other aspects of uh, this anatomy of a learner, uh, you can use this relatively simple uh, approach to achieve some very powerful results. But you have to understand what the physics are of the system in order to make sure that what you're changing uh, will give you the types of behaviors on the end that you desire. Okay. All right. So continuing on. So will it work for any problem? Yeah, yes and no. How do you choose this hypothesis set? We haven't said anything about that. And we'll hold off on that a little bit. But we'll find that there's a consequence for choosing that hypothesis set. Now, in this case of the credit approval problem, it's linear models of a certain dimensionality. But there's more to life than just linear models. Right. And the choice of your hypothesis set will result in sometimes a large hypothesis set, sometimes a small, and there's a consequence of that. And we'll get into some of those consequences in the next uh, module. How do you choose an algorithm? Okay, well, the PLA update is a very simple one, but in practice, what this algorithm determines is the path that you take through the set of hypotheses. So imagine if you were to take a hypothesis set that consists of two weights, W1 and W2. Now you can imagine drawing a representation of a choice of two weights as just a point in some coordinate system. The W1 value is here, the W2 value is there. So when you go from one version of your weights to another, essentially you're moving around in that representation of two dimensional or, or uh, two dimensional hypotheses, linear hypotheses. And so what this algorithm impacts, the choice of algorithm, is the method in which your search moves around in the set of hypotheses. And so later on in the semester, when we talk about regularization, what we'll find is that the smoothness of that path that you take has a lot to do with the quality of the end result for your algorithm. So in general, your algorithm will search through hypothesis space. And you can use any search method you want. You could just randomly choose a weight vector and just try one, try one, try one, right? And yeah, with enough rounds, you'll have the optimal, great. But that path is going to be very jagged. That's almost like if you want to drive someplace, imagine 
you know, you want to drive to Disney World, which is about 12 hours from here in Florida, and you just decided to take your car, randomly pick, pick a location in the United States and drive there, and then randomly pick another location in the U.S. and then drive there, and then you hope eventually, if you did that, you'd eventually get to Disney World, right? But that's the most inefficient way that you could choose to do that. And that's the similar thing that you're doing when you randomly search uh, in your hypothesis space. You might get lucky and just miraculously get <laughs> right at Disney World in your first few randomized guesses, but that doesn't happen in practice. And it's even worse if your hypothesis set is really large, right? Because if it's large, there are more places to jump and it's more uh, jagged, if you will, this path. And so how you choose this algorithm also impacts the quality of solution you get, but also the time it takes to get there, right? And so if you can't afford heavy computational resources, well, maybe you do a hybrid. You jump around wildly, and if you're jumping a wild, around wildly, gets you in the vicinity close to a good solution, and then you start to not make it more smooth, right? So there are all sorts of approach, all sorts of approaches in how you select this algorithm. But at base level right now, uh, the learning algorithm, its responsibility is to search through the space of hypotheses. I'll move this so I don't trip. <laughs> it's to search through the space of hypotheses uh, to try to see if it can mimic the labeling by the ground truth target function. Okay. And so the other question you might ask is how much data do you need? Now, you might be thinking, gosh, well, wholeness, you just got done saying that you don't have control over the data. Absolutely. You don't control what values you're going to get. But for some types of experiments, you can go out and get more data. Let's say you have a, a, a computer vision application. You have a camera measuring the cars driving by DSU on uh, Route 13, right? So. What do you do? Well, it's very cheap. You just turn on the camera and it collects more data, uh, images of cars. Well, that's easy. Um, when I was in graduate school working on my PhD, one of the things we did was image classification of phytoplankton, microaquatic organisms from this ocean. And it's really hard to get those because you have to go out on a boat off the coast and you have to go through all this trouble of, you know, you lower this uh, capsule into the water at certain depths and it opens and traps water at certain depths and then you pull it back and then you bring that water back to the lab. It takes 16 hours to do because you do it a bunch of different places and it's a really expensive and long endeavor. So in other cases, it's really hard or perhaps very expensive uh, getting more data. If you're analyzing uh, soil samples uh, from Mars and a rover, well, it's a lot of money <laughs> to go and get more samples. You just can't go up and get more samples, right? Oh, let's send my grad students to Mars and they'll get more samples. You can't do that, right? Okay, not very easily and not yet, right? <laughs> Although if I were a grad student, I wouldn't want to go to Mars. But anyway, so say I'll choose a new advisor. Um, but nonetheless, how much data do you need? Uh, the more data you have, the better your models will be. Uh, but you also have to ask the question of, is it worth it or even possible to just go out and get more data? Okay. All right. Any questions about this? Yeah. All right. So there are different types of learning categories. And this sort of arose out of commonalities uh, between certain aspects uh, in the anatomy of a learner. And these are your categories. You have so-called unsupervised learning. You have supervised learning. And maybe you've heard these terms before. There's reinforcement learning. And there are all sorts of variants of these. There's something called semi-supervised. It's sort of, you know, uh, straddles supervised and unsupervised, and it's very good for certain types of applications. So let's, at a high level, uh, take a look at these. Uh, supervised learning. So in supervised learning, um, you have your, in, your, your example historical data, and this historical data, uh, each uh, data item is described by a feature vector similar to how we had the credit approval problem. We had a bunch of measurements uh, from a customer, like years in residence, annual salary, and so forth. And we can certainly pose these things as points in some feature space. And again, they're only drawn here in two dimensions because it's easy to talk about in class, right, on a board. And so you also have the ground truth labeling from the target function. So this target function is out there, it's hidden, and it's giving you these labels, right? And these are 100% known. 
but you just don't know what that function is, which is providing these ground truth labels. Now, in the example they carry in the book and in the MOOC uh, video, um, they use this coin classification uh, example. And so you have 10 cent pieces, you have one cent pieces, you have five cent pieces, and you have 25 cent pieces, or the quarters. Now, imagine an application like a vending machine, right? You put your coin in the vending machine, and it knows uh, what a quarter is. Um, so you have these uh, money pieces, these coins, and you can measure things like the size of these coins, and you can also measure things like the mass of these coins. So take, for example, 25 cent piece, a quarter. They're usually bigger in size. And uh, if you were to actually measure and get a caliper or ruler, um, and they're also bigger in mass if you were to weigh them, right? Okay, uh, five cent piece, well, they're not as big as a quarter, uh, but they have a bigger size, and their mass is not as much as a quarter because it's not as much material. Same thing, uh, one cent piece is bigger than a 10 cent piece. I never understood that. Why is a one cent piece its lower value? I guess because of the material, but its size is bigger. I don't know, and a dime is small. Um, but nonetheless, you have a one cent piece, has certain size and mass, likewise a 10 cent piece. Now, for every single um, uh, denomination of coin, now certainly uh, the milling process when you stamp these out, it's not perfect. So you're gonna get some variability uh, for size and mass for all the quarters. It's not gonna be a lot of variability, but it's just plotted very variable to make it look nicer on the board because you don't want these point clouds to be kind of on top of one another, okay? And likewise, you're gonna get some variability for all the other uh, types of coins. So we have ground truth, uh, the input vector feature, size and mass in this case, describing each instance of a coin. And then we also have the ground truth class label in this case, our Y value can take on four different values, uh, a one, a five, a 10, and a 25. And they are labels like dog or cat, only these labels represent the denomination or the amount for each coin, okay? All right, so in so-called supervised learning, um, you have the label that's ground truth. And what the learner enterprises to do is to find a hypothesis uh, such that the values, the classes, the categories into which these are sorted uh, coincide with the labeling of the ground truth target function. So we've only been talking about two-way, plus one, minus one classification, but you could absolutely do this uh, for four different types of coins with two-way classification. So what do you do? You group together all the coins that are not 10 cents, and you group together all the coins that are 10 cents, and then you say all instances of 10 cents, which you know, you call plus one, all instances of things that are not 10 cents, you call minus one. So then you set your hypothesis set, uh, a, a two-dimensional linear model, and then you learn and you get something like this line, right? And so that line will tell you, is it a positive instance of a 10 cent piece or a negative instance of a 10 cent piece? So then you do the same thing with a, a one cent piece, right? So if it's not a 10 cent piece, can it be a one cent piece? And you do that classification again. So you can essentially combine these different lines together to pick out what's a one cent piece, what's a five cent piece, what's a 25 cent piece. Because if you group together things here with things here, and you have that line that you learned for a 10 cent piece versus not 10 cent piece, anything that looks like a one cent piece but it's not a 10 cent piece, that is a one cent piece. Does that make sense? Okay, uh, so you can combine so-called two-way or binary classifications to do arbitrary uh, categories uh, for classification. So you have the actual coin values described by their features as well as the correct category assigned by the ground truth target function. And you're gonna have some variability uh, in those features giving you distributions over the same uh, categories right, 25 cent, 5 cent, 1 cent, and 10 cent. You train a linear classifier given these known values, and then when you get a new input based on these lines, well, you, bur you burn it into an embedded system so it works really fast after you train these weights for these linear classifiers, and then a new coin comes in, its size and its mass is measured, and then you test it against these lines and you output the correct category. And then you display it on the LCD and it says 25 cents. Right? You sense another coin, then you add that value to that other coin. Now, of course, these things are flawed 
because if you have some clever undergrads who go to the change bank <laughs> uh, and exchange, this thing isn't going to verify, um, you know, if it's just size and mass, it's going to be fooled or deceived by a coin that has similar size and mass because they don't have uh, the computation to actually do some real image recognition. Maybe you have a sophisticated deep learning network and a camera and you're looking at what the coin looks like, but it's really hard to do when this thing comes dropping into the coin chute. Okay. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? So this is so-called supervised learning, and it's called supervised learning because you can think of the ground truth target function as supervising your model. It's providing the correction. This is what ground truth looks like for this co-occurrence of a certain size and a mass. This is what a 25 cents label looks like. This is what a 5 cents label looks like. And these are all the variations in size and mass for these categories. And it's up to uh, the learning algorithm to search for a hypothesis that coincides with that correction provided by the ground truth target function. And so for that reason, you can think of the hypothesis set in the learning algorithm more specifically as being supervised by the ground truth target function. Ergo, this is called supervised learning. Okay, so next we have so-called unsupervised learning. And the figure really says a lot about what's happening with unsupervised learning. Again, we have the same coins. We have the same co-occurrence of certain sizes and masses, but in the case of unsupervised learning, you don't have labels provided by the ground truth target function. You just have the feature values associated with each of the data items for the objects under consideration. Now, if you don't have labels, well, you can't do learning in the same way. The best you can do is to compare feature values of all the data points uh, that you have. And so one of the things that happens in unsupervised learning, if you're going to compare feature values, what you want to measure is how similar to one another each one of these points in your geometry are. So here in this first cloud of points in our two-dimensional feature space, we have some quarters, right, in the upper right-hand corner of this 2D plane. Uh, and if you're a quarter, well, your size and mass is off from other quarters, but only just a little bit. So things that are similar are going to have feature values for size and mass for this problem that are very close to one another. And so literally, using things like Euclidean distance, non-Euclidean distances, and stuff like that, you can actually compare to see, are these things similar to one another? And based on that evaluation, you can say, okay, well, all the things that are similar, you want to group them together and say they must be instances of the same uh, quantity, right? The same type. Now, of course, unsupervised learning will group things together, but it won't give a name to it for you, right? So likewise, you know, you can have some nickels, and nickels aren't the same size and aren't the same mass, but maybe you had a horrible problem, something went wrong in the, uh, in the mint, they don't usually produce those, but sometimes, you know, I guess for coin collectors, um, if you have a coin that has a certain type of error, so few errors come out, that coin has a high value as a collectible because very few errors are made in the, in the manufacture of coins. Okay, so nonetheless, you group them together in some fashion by comparing them, and if they are closer to one another in distance from one another, and you can literally use something like Cartesian distance, like the L2 norm. Um, if they're closer to one another, you say, okay, well, they must be in the same group. If they're further away from one another, okay, they must be in different groups. So you can start out with different assumptions and say, I'm going to assume there's one group. And then you'll notice that after you're done, there's a lot of variability in the size and math. So you say, okay, well, let me relax it and assume two groups. So you group them together. Maybe these will be grouped with these. And you notice your variability is really still big. And then you say, I'm gonna try three groups. And maybe you get these with these with these. Well, this group, this group are relatively compact. It's not very uh, variable, but this one's variable. So you say, you know what, let me try four groups. And you end up with these, 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 and these. And then you try five groups, and you notice when you go from four groups to five groups, the variability doesn't change very much. You say, you know what? I'm going to stop and say four groups. So then you go in after the fact, and you take all of the data items from the first group, second group, third group, and fourth group, and then you examine them, you being the user, the scientist, and then you give it a name. I mean, initially, your system could say group one, group two, group three, group four, but then you go in and say, ah, these are 25-cent pieces, these are 10-cent pieces, and so forth. Now, 
A more obvious example pertains to shopping behavior. Now, we only have two axes here, but imagine if you had a different axis for each product that is sold in a market, right? Uh, so, you know, sometimes you go to some markets like Target or the supermarket and they have these uh, cards you have and you scan it. Um, well, that's not to be nice to give you discounts. That's to track your purchases over time. Uh, so now what you can do is every data point represents what you bought in that store. Maybe you bought one of them, maybe you bought zero of them. So you can absolutely, as a multi-dimensional coordinate system, represent one customer's purchase as a dot in that representation. So now you perform this unsupervised learning, and then when you get your groups, well, you can now group them together. And once you examine those groups, you can say, ah, these are college students, because college students like to purchase um, ready prepared meals. And maybe you see things like diapers and formula and a lot of milk. Ah, uh, this is a family that has a baby or a young children, right? They buy different things. And so that's just an example of how you do supervised learning. You let the system group together all the points uh, in some geometry. And then you go in after the fact, once you have those groupings, and you examine them. And you can even compute distributions over uh, the data point values uh, in each one of these groups and now use it to do prediction. And so one of the things that markets do, uh, they say, okay, well, if they know that you belong to the college student group and you go in and buy an item that a lot of college students buy, they say, aha, you must belong to this group, right? So maybe you bought a frozen meal. Ah, you belong to the college student group. And then they look at all the other stuff that college students buy and they randomly pick one, right? And then generate a coupon for you and say, oh, Oh, they have peanut butter on sale. Oh, that's a coupon. Or maybe I'll buy some next time, right? So this custom couponing is what they use unsupervised learning for. Also, if you go on Amazon, and let's say if you buy, um, and now this, this, this example is obvious, you buy an Xbox on Amazon.com. And they say people who buy Xboxes tend to buy this game or a controller, right? Uh, they're doing that same thing. So you can use unsupervised learning to form these groups and then recommend something. They do that in music recommendations and video recommendations in uh, purchasing and stuff like that for custom couponing. Okay, any questions about this? Does that make sense? So with unsupervised learning, you don't have the ground truth class labels, you only have the features. And the best you can do is to compare data points together based on an evaluation of their features, some sort of similarity measure. Distance is one of them. There are many uh, similarity measures you can uh, use to identify groupings of these data points. And then once you organize your groups or clusters, uh, you then go in after the fact and use them, identify them, give them names, or you can compute distributions over them and use them to do prediction and recommendations and all sorts of things like that. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, so now we've talked about supervised and unsupervised. There's something called semi-supervised learning. And semi-supervised learning corresponds to scenarios where you have a lot of data, but this data is not labeled, meaning you don't have ground truth class labels, but you have class labels for high quality class labels for a very small number of things. So for example, um, you know, we all know what um, certain organisms should look like, like a, a giraffe or a dog or a cat or what have you. But you don't really have the time to label every single picture of a dog and cat as a dog and cat. That's expensive. There are lots and lots of images online of dogs and cats. So what do you do? Well, for each breed of dog, you might take a picture that is a very typical picture of what uh, a yellow Labrador retriever should look like, or what a poodle should look like, or what you know a standard domestic short hair cat should look like, or a Persian cat should look like. You take a picture of one that's a, this is a very common looking dog for that particular breed of dog. So then, that's the supervised part, and you label them ground truth. You have people who know biologists and stuff like that who go and say, ah, yes, yes, that is definitely the following. So then, once you have a small number of data points that are have high quality labels, then you do what's called label propagation. And what you do, and this is where the unsupervised learning part comes in, uh, you say, okay, well, given this high quality labeled picture of a dog, 
I'm going to use its features to find other images that are similar to it. And I'm going to assign those unlabeled ones that have similar feature values, I'm going to assign that label to the other. And so it's called label propagation because you can imagine if you're similar, you're going to be in this cluster. And let's say this data point, okay, data points close to it, it's going to assign the label to data points close to it. And then you iterate again. Those that have labels, you're going to assign those labels or propagate the labels in space to those points that are close to it. And then you do that enough times, and eventually you get your labels pushed out uh, throughout all the data points in your geometry. Okay? And that's called semi supervised learning. And semi supervised learning uh, is good when you have abundant data, but it's very costly or expensive to label that data. Okay? So you label some high quality ones, and then you learn the associations and propagate those labels. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? So not only can you have supervised and unsupervised, you can have variants, and semi-supervised is one uh, such variant. Okay, so reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is a form of learning uh, that does what's called sequential decision learning, uh, decision making. Uh, the Roomba vacuum uses reinforcement learning. In fact, the new iRobot 9, um, it does reinforcement learning in the beginning when it's vacuuming the house, it'll just sort of bump around in regular, uh, in uh, irregular patterns, randomized, uh, and then over time it will learn the layout of your house. So then, eventually, it's no longer bumping around randomly; it's uh, vacuuming in a more intelligible fashion, collecting features, putting together a description uh, of your home. Now, the reinforcement learning part says, okay, well. In reinforcement learning, you have an input, right, a value, and typically that's going to be the state, a description of the robot in some environment. And then you're going to have an output, and that output is typically the next state. And you get to that next state by issuing some action or engaging in some behavior. So if you move forward, your position was a certain x, y value. Uh, if you move forward, that value has changed. So your next state is going to be a new coordinate. Now, you know if you move forward, backwards, left, or right, so you can basically construct a very simple Cartesian representation of where you, the robot, believes you are in, in the world. Now, associated with each input and output pair, the X and the output, is a grade. And this grade is based on something um, called uh, a reward function, right? So suppose you wanted to navigate, say, from here, geographically to the campus center, and you didn't know how to get there. Well, you could randomly take steps forward, backwards, left and right, randomly choose a direction, take, make a move, randomly choose a direction, make a move, and my reward function might be one over the distance between me geographically and the campus center. So what happens over time? Some steps that I take are going to move me further away from the campus center, so one over that distance is going to be small, so I get small reward for that action at that location. Other steps are going to move me closer to the campus center, so one over that distance is going to be a greater reward for taking that particular action from that location. So if I randomize this over time and I compute the expected, uh, expectation of all the accumulated reward, essentially what I can do is build up a method of determining how to act, what action to take from every location in the map. So if I do that long enough, eventually, without having to randomly explore where to go, I can just say, okay, I tried a million times randomly taking a step, and I know from this location, my best step that gives me the most average reward is going to be to go that way. And the same thing happens in this location. Same thing happens in the next location. And what ends up happening is you construct a path piecewise from here to the campus center. So you no longer have to randomly try actions. So what this reinforcement learning involves is this reward function, which is a really important step of it. And the scheme is to try randomizing your actions so that you maximize the accumulated grade or score or reward function associated with each configuration uh, that your system can be in. 
and you're testing out and trying different options. And so reinforcement learning comes from the, started from the psychology literature and a lot of pioneering work in reinforcement learning was done at UMass Amherst, a computer science department. Um, and it's based on the dopamine response, how you train animals, right? So when you're training an animal, um, I have a dog and you know, if you want the dog to do something, you give it a treat that it likes. And then if you want the dog to do it again, you give it a treat and it learns to associate a pleasant experience with that action because you're giving the treat at that time. So then you decrease the amount of treat and then eventually you don't have any treat and then you do the same action and the dog says, ah, that's a pleasant thing. So let me do that action again, right? And that's exactly what reinforcement learning is based on. You take that action from a certain context uh, in a certain context associated with a maximum reward over time. Okay. Any questions about this? And so reinforcement learning is really big in robotics because if you think about what happens with a robot, a robot takes actions in time. And if you want the robot to uncover on its own, what is the best sequence of actions to take in an environment, this sequential decision learning and reinforcement learning is a perfect model for that. And so there are a lot of um, reinforcement learning systems that do things like play Go, play backgammon, play chess and stuff, all sorts of things, as well as robotics. Okay. All right. Any questions about this? No? Makes sense. Uh, so we won't cover reinforcement learning in this class. Uh, in fact, at UMass, you have a whole two semesters of just reinforcement learning because they've done so much work in that. Uh, but it's an important part of learning, uh, which is more uh, reserved for an advanced level uh, course, uh, maybe like a first year PhD level course uh, in reinforcement learning specifically. Uh, but there's lots of courses out there on it. We just don't have it in our curriculum. Okay. So I have a question for the two of you. So here we have two inputs and these inputs are three by three uh, squares and they're colored in black and white differently, right? And let's say these were inputs to some function and the target function for the three in the top row, it output a negative one and the target function for the three inputs on the second row, it output a positive one. So given that assignment of inputs uh, to target function outputs, if you were given this new input, what would you output as a target function? A plus one or a minus one? What do you think? Plus one? Okay, so you say plus one. So what do you say? Negative one. Okay, you're both right and you're both wrong, right? It's a trick question. Uh, you could find examples where you could do both of them. So for example, you could say, all right, well, um, if the uh, center square is white, you're going to output a negative one. If the center square, well, that's not true. I just violated that. Oh, I had this in my brain before. Let's see. Uppermost corner. Lower. I had this in my mind before. Let's see. If the upper left, is it left? Minus. Yes, 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 yes. Right. If the upper left corner is black, you output a minus one. If the upper left corner is white, you output a plus one. Right. So you could argue here the upper left corner is uh, black, so you output a minus one. Okay. Now you could argue then if the uh, where was the other one? When it's big, I had this on my brain for this. So uh, let's see. You could argue if mm -hmm. uh huh. Which corners these or all four? All four. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Okay, good, good. If it's, okay, good. Thank you. I couldn't remember what I, what I had looked at. <laughs> Thank you very much. So you can invent many different ways of thinking why you'd be a plus one or why you'd be a minus one. And so what's do, what we're doing here is overfitting, right? You're trying to make a pattern where a pattern doesn't exist out of noise. And part of that problem is that you don't have enough data uh, to really uh, draw a conclusion from it. Okay, um, so any final questions about this intro? No? Okay, makes sense. All right, so let's uh, continue on and let me uh, check the time, 5.13. Wow, that was fast. Um, so uh, again, there's the 
information about the assignment that's due. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop out of MATLAB, I mean out of uh, PowerPoint uh, for a moment, and go over a couple of points as it pertains, uh, not all of it, but a little bit, as it pertains uh, to implementing uh, perceptron learning algorithm. Okay. So this is MATLAB, and that's from a different class. Let me do that. Uh, spring 2020. Open. Machine learning. Open. MATLAB. Uh, add path. Subfolders. And I wonder if I already have it in there. Okay, so um, I'll do it interactively. New script. Okay, so you can create a script. A script is nothing more than a pro, uh, program. You can also create a function. And when you create a script, you just save it. Uh, my test, say test PLA dot uh, M is the extension uh, for lab, MATLAB file. Now. A MATLAB file is nothing more than a text file, just like any other program in a programming language, only it's meaningful uh, to the MATLAB interpreter. Now, MATLAB will run from the command line and execute your MATLAB programs like Python, uh, but you can also run it from uh, the MATLAB editor, which is this environment, which is like an IDE, like NetBeans or, or Eclipse or you know uh, Visual Studio, uh, those sort of things. Um, and so uh, MATLAB, uh, uh, program editor is the only one that can uh, edit and run MATLAB in a debugger-like uh, environment. And so another uh, thing you can create in addition to programs, yes, question. It looks like Python, the syntax, the way you form uh, constructs like loops and conditionals, if-then statements and stuff like that. And I like to say Python looks like MATLAB since MATLAB was around much longer than Python. Um, but it can't run Python. Um, MATLAB is just text file like any programming language, but similar to Python, um, you can take a Py program and from the command line, uh, execute Python interpreter and say Python space and the name of the, the Python program. In similar fashion, you can do that with MATLAB. So you type MATLAB space and then the name of the MATLAB M file and it'll load it and run it, just like how Python loads and runs Python programs. Okay, all right, um, any other questions? So this is a MATLAB script, and MATLAB script uh, is just a programming uh, program. You can also create a MATLAB function, right? So let me start with a function. So in MATLAB, typically when you have a function, uh, the name of the M file uh, coincides with the name of the function. So if I said function, right, that's how you tell the interpreter that this is a function, uh, the return value, uh, ret val, equals... Um, uh, test function, the name of the function, and you have the parameter, param1, param2. And let's say for the sake of uh, argument, I wanted to say I'm going to uh, return val, and that's how you return something from a, a MATLAB program, is equal to parameter1 plus parameter2, for example. Simple program. Now, unlike Python, in MATLAB, um, you have uh, each statement uh, delimited by a semicolon. Python, you don't have uh, delimiters uh, for your uh, statements. Uh, did I? Oh, param1 and param2. Yeah, there we go. Save. Oops. So now, when I go to save it, you'll notice it pops up and says test function.m, right? And so that's how you write functions in MATLAB. The name of the file is also the name of the function signature. Does that make sense? Okay, so you can actually use it later. So let me try this. And the interesting part about MATLAB is that not only can you return a single value, you can return multiple values on the command line, and I'll demonstrate that uh, in a moment. So now, in my test program, let's say if I said A equals 5, and B equals 7, and now a sum, the sum, is equal to test function, and I'll give it my parameters A and B, so now I'm calling that function that I just created, and let me say um, a message sprintf, I'm creating a string, the sum is, 
uh, percent D backslash N comma the sum. Hopefully I did that right. Yes. Uh, nope, I didn't terminate the, uh, what did I do? There we go. Okay, there. And now I say display that string. So I'm creating a formatted string with the result, and now I'm displaying it to the command line. So you notice here in this environment, as I write executable statements, I get these numbers along uh, the left-hand side, and some of them will have these little uh, dash marks next to them. Uh, so a dash mark uh, comprises or identifies um, each of the executable statements, and as an executable statement, I can set a breakpoint in the debugger. And so if I click on this dash, you'll notice I get a little red dot. If I click on it again, the red dot goes away. Uh, that's setting a breakpoint. And so I can break my execution anywhere in this program and examine all sorts of stuff. So let me start, and I'll run my program. And so you'll notice here I get this arrow. And this arrow uh, marks for me uh, the current line where the next execution will be. It's kind of like the program counter, if you will. Uh, and so here, if I hover my mouse over something, I get this pop-up note. Uh, and that pop-up note tells me what the value is associated with that variable. You'll also notice, as I instantiate things in MATLAB, I have this workspace, and this workspace represents the memory associated with each thing that I can store. So right now, the value of A, I created a value 5 and assigned it to variable A. Uh, if I hover my uh, cursor over variable A, it shows me what it is. But also, I can go over to the workspace and take a look at what A's value is. Now, I can double click on this and go inside and actually physically change the value live while I'm debugging. So instead of 5, if I said 7, right? And then I go back. Let me close that. And now, if I hover over, A is equal to 7. So you can do live debugging in MATLAB just like any sort of traditional debugger. And so now, even though the program says 5, I've changed it in the debugger to be 7. Let me go back and change it back to 5, just so I can finish uh, the point that I was going to make, enter. And so now it's back to 5. If I put the cursor over, lo and behold, it's back to 5 again. So now I instantiate B, and when I'm running, I can do all sorts of partial execution in my development environment. I can single step, and step means to execute the next statement, step. So you notice now I executed the assignment to B, and uh, in my workspace, I create allocated memory for B, and it's equal to 7. So now I have test function. Now there are different ways of stepping through code. If I said step, it's going to execute this function and go to the next line. If I say step in, it's going to execute the next statement, jumping inside the function, uh, uh, executing the first statement inside that function, which would be uh, this return value assignment. So let me say step in, and when I click step in, it's going to execute a single statement, which is the calling into the function, and it's going to go inside the function. And you notice here, I'm inside the function now. Now, if I say single step, it's going to go to the next uh, statement, which is this addition, and then it's going to return back to whomever called this function. So the step in means step into a function if it's a function. Likewise, step out says execute all the statements up to and including the return of the function. So if I said step in, and let's say I had five lines in this function, it would put me on the first line of the function. If I said step out, it would execute all the lines of the function and return back out to the caller. Uh, so if I say step out here, it steps back out, the function has executed, and then the next step I take is to assign the return value from the function to that variable I'm calling the sum. Does that make sense? So if I step over that, you'll notice the sum gets created, and its value is 12, which is 5 plus 7, which is exactly what the implementation of that function was. So now I create a message step, and you notice message is a character array. So there's my message. It says the sum is 12, right? Now, when you have formatted character arrays, uh, percent %s, and you can look this up in the MATLAB documentation. They're excellent in their documentation. And there's also a lot of stuff on something called Stack Exchange with MATLAB documentation. And it says create a string, the sum is, space, and percent %d. It's going to replace that percent %d with the contents of that variable. So it says the sum is, and then... Uh, percent %d, 
that variable's value is 12, so that's where the percent D gets replaced with uh, 12, and percent D means decimal. Percent F is for floating point, percent S is for string. Now this backslash N is just a new line carriage return, uh, so that when it displays on the screen, it'll put a new line after it shows that text. So DISP is to actually physically display the message. When I execute that, you'll notice on the output window, the command window, it actually prints that text. Okay? Any questions? All right, so MATLAB is really good um, with uh, data manipulation. That's just basic functions and, and stuff like that. Uh, so MATLAB is really good uh, with data, matrix vector operations. And so one of the ways in which you might store data uh, is as a so-called CSV or comma-separated value file. So I'm going to create a very simple uh, CSV file, uh, Dropbox, DSU, classes, uh, spring 2020, uh, star learning. I just need to get to the right directory, MATLAB. Okay. All right, so now let me create a function called test C, uh, test um, data.csv. Okay. So this test data.csv, I'm going to pretend these are customer records, right? And I'm just going to have two pieces of information, um, a salary and uh, years in residence. Okay. So let's say we only have two people, right? So just to make it easy. Uh, and the first person, you know, is doing pretty well by U.S. standards. And maybe he makes $120,000. 120 per year, and he's lived in his residence, uh, say, for 14 years. I'm just making up these numbers. And so you, let's say you have another person, and let's say this person who was 120,000 in 14 years, uh, this person was a good credit risk uh, at the bank, so that person's a plus one, right? And so let's say this other person makes, um, say, uh, $40,000, right, 40 000, and I separate that by comma, and has only lived uh, someplace, let's say, for uh, um, for two years, right? Not very long. And let's say the bank said that's a bad credit risk, a minus one, right? So here we have two features. The first feature uh, is the um, annual salary, and the second feature uh, is the number of years in residence, and the third feature uh, is that Y value, uh, the plus one or minus one, okay? All right, so this is a so-called comma separated value file because the values are separated by comma, right? Okay, now, so let's save that. And now if we go into MATLAB, um, let's say X is our data file to kind of mimic what we've been talking about um, in the anatomy of a learner. And we're gonna assign that the result of CSV read, right? And because I like to do a little bit of semblance of software engineering, we'll say data file name is gonna be uh, the name of the data file, which I think I call it testdata.csv. Test so I'm going to say dot forward slash testdata.csv. Because I'm on a, a Unix system, Mac OS is Unix underneath, I'm going to use Unix naming to say the current directory, right? All right, so that's my data file name, uh, testdata.csv, and I'm going to say csv read data file name. Okay, so I'm going to read that comma separated value file. And that's another thing that why MATLAB is so powerful is they provide a lot of APIs to relieve you from all the headaches that you would have in other languages for doing stuff like reading data files and you know computing things like eigen decompositions and stuff like that. Uh, with MATLAB, you can write software that very closely mimics the math. So you focus on the modeling task, not on all these loose ends uh, that are, I'll say, distracting. <laughs> all right. So we did the CSV read. So let me set a breakpoint there. Okay. What did I do? Oh, yeah. I have a, there we go. That's a supposed, supposed to be a string. All right. So let me set a breakpoint there. And I don't care about breakpoints anywhere else. Let me run it. So now in the debugger, I'm going to step. And now you'll see here's X, right? So if I bring up X in the command window, guess what? I have a matrix. And that matrix, my first column, that's the annual salary I had in CSV. Second column is uh, years in residence. And third column, that's the ground truth class label. Okay, so now the other thing that's the beauty of MATLAB, while your program is running, you can interactively manipulate it. So if I said in this command window, show me big X, 
it's going to show me all the contents of that matrix X. And it does exactly that. Now you have slicing operators. If I say X and I reference it like it's an array, right? Um, in MATLAB, the wildcard operator, meaning like star or I don't care, substitute any value, is the colon uh, symbol. So if I say X, one comma one, and in MATLAB, when you access arrays or matrices, it's one's base, not zero's base. So the first position is indexed by number one, right? Whereas in C and Java, the first position is indexed by zero. MATLAB is one's base. So if I said X, one comma one, it's gonna take this matrix X and it's gonna get me the first row, the first column, which is 120,000. So if I do that, hit enter, I get back 120,000. If I say the first row, um, the second row, the first column, right? It's gonna give me back 40,000 because that's the first, uh, no, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, the second row, uh, first column, because that's the second row is the, the second data item. First column is 40,000. So I get back 40,000. So now with this X, what I can do, let me just retype X here just for, um, for uh, reference uh, sake. Uh, so now, let me see, clear, 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 clears out all of the memory uh, that was saved. So clear, clear, CLC clears the console, right? Um, so I'm going to have to run this again because I cleared all the memory. Um, so run and I step. So you notice all my memory is there. So now if I say, show me X, okay, now show me X, but I'm going to say wildcard for the row, and I'm going to say uh, one for the column. So that means show me every row, just the first column. So that's going to get me the salaries, 120,000 and 40,000, right? So if I did that, show me any row, the second column, that's going to give me all of the years of residence, which is 14 and 2. And likewise, the class labels, which is plus one and minus one. So using the slice operator, uh, you can display and return back uh, any uh, range, if you will, or rectangle carved out of the original matrix. So why am I doing this? Well, remember, when you want to do classification, you want the data separate from the labels. So if I want the data portion, I only want the first two columns of the CSV file because I don't use the class label when I'm manipulating the data when I'm doing W transpose X, right? So one thing I could do, I could say the data, the raw data is equal to X, give me, oh, I forgot one part. Um, if I said size of X, right? It gives me the number of rows and the number of columns in that matrix, right? So now I can say the number of rows and the number of columns for that data is equal to size of X. And what it will do is it'll assign the first variable, the first number, and the second variable in this list, the second number. So now if I said rows, that's equal to two. If I said call, it should be calls, it's equal to three. So now I know that the last column which is also the third column, is always going to be the class label. That's a standard in machine learning data sets. So now I can say the raw data is equal to X matrix. I don't care about the rows, but I care about only the first and second columns. So when I want only the first and second columns, well, I'd say start at the first column, increment by one, end at the second column. Right, so that's how you define a list of things. So if I say shift and, uh, and then close it, if I say the raw data, that gives me just the data portion, the first and second column. I'm gonna show you what that one colon one colon two does. If I said one colon one colon two, that just gives me a list one two. So that's what it's substituting. If I said one colon one colon five, it'll say one, two, three, four, five, right? Uh, I could say, one colon two colon 11, and it would start at one, end at 11, increment by two, right? So here I have one, three, five, seven, nine, 11. So what this sequence did when I said X uh, colon comma one colon one colon two, it said any row of X, but for the columns, 
all the columns from this list, which is a list starting at one, incrementing by one, ending in two, which is one and two, right? So the result of that, if I say the raw data, is just all the data portions without the class labels. Now, of course, if I want to do classification, I want the labels, which is just those portions of X, um, any row, but that last column, which is call that I got from the size measurement. So if I do that and I say the labels, it shows me all the class labels. So that means the first class label, right, in that list, the labels, if I said size, the labels, it's two by one, right? It's two rows, one column. So it's a column vector. And the first position is the label for the first row of the raw data, right? That's the plus one. The second label, minus one, is a label for the second row of the data. Does that make sense? So this is just to show you how you read a data file and how you slice up uh, that data in order to isolate the class labels uh, from the actual raw data. Now, this is where it gets to when we talked about that W, because remember, we said we had a threshold, right? And then we had an X naught. Now, here, the raw data, this is our X vector. And remember, we augment the x vector with a dummy variable called x naught. So if we said the augmented data, that's nothing more than having a one vector in the first position as a column. Now here, uh, uh, let's see, size of the raw data. We know the raw data has two rows and two columns, right? And so the number of rows is going to be the size of the vertical vector that we're going to insert in front of all the other data because we want to have an X naught. So here, the first uh, record is 120,014, right? We want to have a 1, which is our X naught. This is 120,000 our X, is our X1, and this 14 is our X2. So we want to have a 1, a, ve a column vector of 1s, as the first vector, and we want to turn this from a two by two uh, to a two by three. Does that make sense? Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, one of the things you can do, you say, oh gosh, well, how many rows are there? Well, I say uh, rows, rows, calls, so I'm reassigning them is equal to the size of the raw data, right? And so now I'm going to create a column vector. So I'm going to say, um, X not, see, X not is X zero a vector. X not, I'll do it that way, is equal to uh, ones, create a vector of ones, and it's going to be of size, uh, we're going to have rows by one. So it's going to be a two by one, right? Where rows is the number of rows in that um, uh, raw data. So if we say X not, show it to me, guess what? It's a column vector of ones. So now I'm going to create augmented data. Augmented data is equal to, I'm going to form a new matrix. And that new matrix, um, when you talk about a column, you're going to, uh, man, I, I can remember this. Uh, let me see. Uh, temp is equal to four column five. Semi seven. I didn't just remind myself of something. Yep. Okay. I use semicolon um, when I create the columns of a matrix, right? I separate the columns by semicolon. So now if I say augmented data, right, is equal to the X naught, which, oops, is equal to the X naught, which is the first column of the matrix. And the second and third column is going to be, what do you think it's going to be? The raw data. Okay. So now if I do that, oops, what did I just do? What did I just do? Oh, you know what I should do? Let me try this. The raw data, um, star one, let me see if that works. Uh, the raw data, maybe it likes them individually, that makes sense, uh, by two. So instead of using the whole matrix, I just do it one column at a time. Okay, yeah, it didn't like that. That makes sense because it's a rectangle and you're trying to 
put columns where, where uh, and, you, and I supplied a rectangle. So if I said aug data, oops, what just happened? That's not right. That's weird. Huh? The raw data, aug data one. Huh? That's weird. X not. See X not. The raw data. Oh, I see. I see. I see. Um, aug data equals zeros. I'm going to do it the long way. Um, and I'm going to say it is um, uh, uh, rows many rows and then three columns. All right, so now aug data uh, zero is equal to x naught. What? Indices must be positive. Hmm? Oh, oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's late for me. Thank you. <laughs> aug data. Um, uh, uh, two, two is equal to um, the raw data one, aug data three, the third column is equal to the raw data two. Okay, that should do it. Aug data. There we go. That's what I'm trying to do. All right. It doesn't like when you do, oh, they change MATLAB from year to year. Uh, when you do commas, so if I said temp is equal to, if I say 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, right, that puts it all in the same row, right? But if you say semicolon, temp equals uh, 5, 4, 3, to one separate by semicolon, it's in the same co uh, column, right? Oh, I did. Because I did this. Oh, 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 they should be beside one. You're right, you're right. The columns are in different rows. Yes, you're absolutely right. I should have done, done this. Um, I see what you're saying. Yes, thank you for that. Yeah, all right. You're absolutely right. So what happens after a certain amount of time? <laughs> the brain cells don't work as well. First class is 9.30, my second class is noon, and now this class is 4.30. So um, you get the scraps when, <laughs> by the end of the day. Uh, okay, good. So now we have augmented data, and it's augmented with an X naught, and now we need uh, a W. So W, you just choose one. It doesn't matter what W is. Uh, w is a column vector. You can just say W is one, four, seven, I just made that up. Uh, so let me make vectors, the standard is column vector, uh, one, four, five, okay. So now, here's my W vector, and this is my uh, X vector. So let's say if I want to compute W transpose X, right? Uh, so my transpose W, I need to change aug data uh, to be a transpose. So, uh, because you have to remember, it's really important. If I say X is equal to Aug data, um, the first row, ignore the column. X is my first record. It's augmented. My X naught is one, and there's my X one, and there's my X two. Now, you have to choose a standard for your vectors. You can make both all vectors row vectors or column vectors, but you have to choose a standard. So because this is a row vector, I'm going to say X. Uh, one is equal to x transpose, right? Tick mark is uh, is transpose. So now x one, it's now a column vector. So here's my w, right? Which is w naught, which is my minus t from the math. Uh, and here's my x. Oops, there's my x one, which is my feature that's augmented with x naught. Now they're both column vectors. So now if I wanted to classify this, right, my hypothesis is that set of Ws, I'd say um, sine, so H 
of x is equal to sine of w transpose x, which is 1, w transpose times, times x, 1, right? And I get back a plus 1. And there's my classification, right? So now, because that was my first x out of my raw data, and I'm only doing it with two data points, I would compare this h of x with my f of x, which is my ground truth class label. And that's from the labels, the first one, because it's the first data point. So I look at my f of x, which is a 1, and I look at my h of x, which is also a 1. So they agree. It's not misclassified. Now, I could certainly have applied it to every single row instead of doing it one by one, but I just want to illustrate to you uh, what that means in code, right, in MATLAB. Now, the important part to remember is that when you get a final hypothesis W, right, let's say your final W was 1, 4, 5. Remember um, that W naught, that's just the threshold. But if you wanted to go back to two dimensions and actually draw that line, you're going to draw it using the W1 and W2. The only purpose of W0 was to absorb that threshold when you're doing the calculation. And so there's a difference between, oh, it's 545. There's a difference between the model that you use for learning, and then once you get the final solution, if you want to visualize it, because it's only two features, the annual salary and the years and residence, if you want to actually plot the data, you're going to plot the data using annual salary and years in residence. If you want to draw the line representing the hypothesis, the decision boundary, you're going to draw it using W1 and W2, not with the W0. Does that make sense? So distinguish between what you need for the model to learn and to actually draw the solution. Because if I wanted to plot these, I could actually plot my data point and I can plot the W. Does that make sense? OK. All right. So with that, um, that's the balance of time. I guess I'll save the next module uh, for Tuesday, and hopefully that's enough to get you started um, and uh, kind of speeding up uh, the implementation uh, of the assignment. And so what I'd rather have you focusing on is uh, the impact of the search through the hypothesis space, and you're actually going to implement this W gets W trust, uh, plus XI times YI. Does that make sense? All right, so all this other stuff is just some loose ends to tie up uh, to understand. And the biggest takeaway is the difference between the model and the solution if you want to draw it out, right? Okay, all right, so with that, we'll end there.